Um, good morning and uh, welcome to church today. Today we have uh, James, James Garnett. So you may have noticed the fa face is not uh, unfamiliar to us because he was here as a, a trainee t uh, preacher in, in our circuit. But today, actually yesterday probably, is uh, actually came all the way from Aberdeen just to be with us. So please welcome James. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Anna, for your welcome. Thank you for your welcome. I really appreciated your welcome four years ago when I was training for the ministry. And it's good to be back, see, to see some familiar faces, to see some new faces as well. Son and Spirit, we gather in your eternal presence, here and now. We gather to praise and worship you as the source of all that makes life worth living. We gather to recognize that we have not always valued you through our actions as we do in our words. We gather to learn more of your life of love and to seek the renewal of your spirit in our hearts. Gracious God, open your arms to us as we gather in your name. Forgive us our waywardness, give us peace, so that we may grow in the life and service of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Uh, I wanted to, uh, to ask you to put your hands up if you like chocolate. Anybody like, like chocolate? Yeah, my, my, my daughter, until the age of about 10, didn't like chocolate, so I don't take it for granted. So I want to uh, invite you to imagine that you're going to a shop to buy chocolate or with someone who will buy you chocolate. And you're standing looking at the shelves and, and you have a choice. There's the own brand chocolate. This happens to come from Sainsbury's, but this isn't an advertisement. There's dairy milk. Again, not an advertisement, but there it is. And there is green and black's organic fair trade. So I wonder which one you would choose. Which one would you, would you choose and why? How would you decide between these three different options? There are different reasons for valuing different chocolates, aren't there? And which chocolate you buy will show what's most important to you, won't it? So it could be that you actually like, you prefer the flavour of the dairy milk, but you're going to buy the green and blacks because you think the fair trade is important, because organic chocolate is important. And it's also part of our life that we, we can say we, we value one thing. We say, oh yes, it's really important to have fair trade, but actually I, I really like dairy milk, so I'm going to, going, to, going to buy that. And it's a characteristic of our life that it, it, well, whatever we say, it's our actions that show what we really do value, particularly our actions over a period of time. One off, you say, oh well, I normally buy this one, but I'm going to buy this today because it's a treat. But it's our actions that show what we, we really value. And we're in church today because we say, well, God is the most important thing in our lives. We're here because God is what we value above all other things. So we're here to express that, and we're here to learn more about what that means and how to live our lives so that our words of worship are matched by the actions that, that we do. Because it's very easy to say, well, God is the most important thing, and then act in other ways. We all know that. So that's what we're about today. We're thinking about what do we really value, what, and, and how do we live that out in our lives. And this next hymn is, is a song about, is about God. It's about what, what we, what we, how we think of God. Sometime later, God tasted Abraham. He said to him, 
Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it said, on the mountain of the Lord will it be provided. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. That's a horrific reading, isn't it? And to, to grasp the true horror of that reading, we need, we need to remember some of the background. That this wasn't just Abraham's son. But Isaac was the child of Abraham and Sarah in their old age. He was the child that is displaced Ishmael, the son of Abraham and, and Hagar, from, from that household. He was the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. And yet there was Abraham with the knife poised over his son. Some have described this, this story as an example of divine child abuse. And have asked, what sort of God is this? But that is to miss the point of this story. And the point of the story is to ask the question, what is it that we value most in life? And the story poses that question by asking the related question, what are you prepared to give up? And you can imagine God having a conversation with us, can't you? You can imagine God saying, James, yes, yes Lord? Am I, am I more important to you than everything in the whole world? Of, of course you are, Lord. Yes, I worship you. Hmm. Am I more important to you than chocolate? Well, yes, Lord. Good. Give up chocolate for Lent. Am I more important to you than money? Yes, Lord. Yes, you're, you're more important to me than money. Good. Give up your job and come and work for me. Am I more important to you than your family? Mm, yes, Lord, you're the most important thing in my life. Am I important, more important to you than your son, your only son? You can see where this reading takes us, can't you? We can tell what's most important in our lives by what we're prepared to give up. And COVID, posed that question to us, didn't it? What are you prepared to give up in order to save life? That was the question that as a nation, as a world, 
particularly in those parts of the world that could afford to give things up. It was a question that we were asked. And so we did, didn't we? We gave up work, we gave up family, we gave up parties. Well, most of us did. <laughs> we even gave up coming to church. And so the, the story of Abraham and Isaac teaches us that what we're prepared to give up shows what it is that we value most. And our willingness to give up church to save life shows that we valued life more than we valued church. Our actions show what it is that we really value. But it has left us with two slightly awkward questions. And the first question is, what is it that we really value about life? And as we find out more about the long-term impact of the lockdowns on mental health and on physical health, we are realizing that there is more to life than simply breathing, aren't we? And the other awkward question is, what do we really value about church? And this question is particularly awkward when we're celebrating a significant anniversary, as you are here this year and as we are in Aberdeen. The, the, the current building in Aberdeen was, uh, was built 150 years ago, and in, in Wallingford as well, just, just north of here, it was a town where, where, where I lived before the, um, being stationed to Aberdeen um, and they're, they're celebrating their 150th anniversary today and I have the opportunity to preach there this afternoon as well. There's a real rash of church building in 1873. Trying to get a builder to do anything else in 1873 must be very difficult. But now that we're, we're back here together, we, we can reflect on what, what is it we've learnt and what, what way is our church important to us? Having gone through that period when our actions showed that actually some other things were, were more important to us than the building. We're going to think further about both of these questions, what, what's really important about life and what's really important about our church, with the aid of our next reading. It comes from Matthew chapter 10, and it comes from the end of a passage where, where Jesus sends out the disciples to, to the, 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 the lost sheep of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Israel. He sends the disciples out proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God has come near. He sends them out proclaiming it and he sends them out demonstrating it. They were to heal, to make people whole. They were to do that without charging any money. So they were to do that with generosity and they were to do that without taking anything with them. They were to live off the generosity of the people they met. So this was a, a living of the kingdom of God as well as a proclaiming of the kingdom of God. So when we'll hear that this, the passage, which, which comes at the end of this, this discourse, which begins in, in Matthew, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, um, Jesus starts by echoing some of the sentiments from the reading about Abraham and Isaac. But then he turns it around and starts to talk about what do we welcome. So we've thought about how what we give up says something about what we value. But this reading will then lead us towards thinking what, what we welcome also tells us something about what it is we really value. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sends me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Amen. So what is it that we really value about life? What is it that we really value about our church? To explore these questions in the, in the light of that reading from Matthew's Gospel, I'd like to share with you something of our life in Aberdeen in these, these last four years. Back in 2017, so bef well before the pandemic and well before I went there, uh, the church in Aberdeen had started what they call Open Table 
they offer a, f a free three-course meal to homeless and vulnerable people in the city every Sunday. So, of course, when the, the lockdowns hit us, uh, we thought, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, decided very quickly that we needed to, to continue to offer this meal every week. And we did. We offered a takeaway meal, a hot takeaway meal from the car park of the church every Sunday um, throughout that, that period. I don't think we missed a, a week. And we learnt quite a lot by being outside the church rather than inside the church. We learnt that people came not so much for the food, although they did come for the food, and we prided ourselves in make, making good food, but they came for the conversation. And that was particularly true of that period of, of isolation. We also learnt that they came not just for the conversation on a Sunday, but there was a need for conversation during the week as well, and that this wasn't just a feature of pandemic life, when we were all starved of, of conversation during the week, but it, when people talked to us of, of the time before the lockdown, that they, they said, well, it was, it was nice to come for a meal on the Sunday and to meet other people, but it's a long week, and when, when, when there's not a lot going on in your life, um, seeing people having life-giving conversations um, was important. And we also learned something important about being a guest and being a host. Because there we were with a table in the car park, people giving out food from this side to people receiving food on the other side. Guest, host. But what we learned over the weeks was that the conversation was valued as much by the people giving out the food as it was by the people receiving the food. And as we came to reflect on this, we, we came to, to, to theologize it and say, well, actually, God is the host here. We are guests on both sides of the table. And that we, we, we have as much to, to learn and to, to gain, to be fed by these conversations when we're giving out the food as we are, as, as those who are receiving the food. So when we were able to get back in, in the church building and, and, and build on some of these things we learned, we started what we called open house, open table on a Sunday, open house during the week. We were initially one day a week, we opened up the sanctuary of the church to invite people in for tea, coffee, conversation and activities. And as that has developed, the person who now runs that every day is somebody who first came to the church as a guest of, of Open House. And for the first couple of months, didn't say a thing. Um, but he, he now runs that every day. And as he's developed that ministry, uh, he's, he's started cooking each day. And the food that he cooks is bought by the people who come as surplus food from food banks around the city. Um, so that people come offering food which then gets cooked and gets, gets offered back. So what's developed is a real community around this with about 80 or so visits every week. Um, some, some, some people are there every day and included in that, that 80. Others come a couple of times a week, others less frequently than that. And so Open House has challenged us to think about what is it that we, we really value about life, particularly life in the context of, of the church. Because on the face of it, open house is about providing food, a warm space, and a safe space. As, as we've been challenged by, in, in providing those things over the years, we've, we've learnt that, that really those are secondary. What, what open house is about is about providing community. It's about developing relationship. And the, the food and everything else is the means by which we develop a community. On the face of it, we're welcoming vulnerable and lonely people into our church so that they can meet Christ. But what we have found is that it's the people who come to open house who bring Christ to us. We hear stories of addiction and ill health, mental and physical ill health. But we also hear stories of generosity and of hope, of humility and thanksgiving that open our eyes to the privileged limitations of our own lives. And so we've come to realize that our witness to Christ lies in recognizing his presence already in the lives of the, the, the world around us and the lives of those vulnerable people who come and share their company with us and already being there in the lives of those secular charities that help those people elsewhere around the city. Our witness is to say, this is love. This is what life is about. This is Christ. And what about building? 
What have we come to value about this place that we've grown used to calling our church over 150 years? When we started Open House, there were some members of the Sunday congregation who were a little unsure about opening up the sanctuary to offer hospitality during the week. This was a, a sacred space. But we've learned that the building itself is part of our witness. One of the conditions of the, the government funding was that we shouldn't promote religion at, at Open House. And we found that we don't need to. People come into this, this space, this space which speaks to them of God, that speaks to them of peace, of safety, and ask us about faith. They tell us about their faith. The building helps conversations about faith to happen. And to be honest with you, I have more conversations about faith on Monday to Friday at Open House than I do on a Sunday morning. It's, it sort of turns an idea of what it is to be a church upside down. And that midweek church has helped to influence our Sunday morning worship as well. We've, we've chairs in, in the Aberdeen church, um, which very often are laid out as if they were pews. Certainly before COVID, that's how they were. But we now have six large round tables that, that fill, fill the space. And mainly because we were too lazy to keep putting them away for a Sunday and then putting them back up on a Monday, we decided to leave them out. And this has helped to make a less formal worship space. And it's helped to remind us of what happens during the week. And it's helped to remind us that when we come together on a Sunday to worship, what's important isn't so much the perfection of our hymn singing or the beauty of our prayers. It is the community. It is a relationship. It is being together and seeing Christ in one another and witnessing to Christ in our lives. Jesus said to his disciples, Go, proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God has drawn near. Somehow over the centuries, the church has turned go into come, hasn't it? And somehow over the centuries, the church has turned the message of the good news into the message about Jesus, the bringer of the good news. And so in this 150th anniversary of our buildings, we're reminded that buildings matter because of what they stand for. The buildings are a symbol of the love of Christ. Symbols whose meaning comes from what goes on within those buildings. What goes on that expresses and recognizes the love of Christ. And so these these wonderful buildings stand as a reminder to us inside them, as well as all those people who walk past every day of the week. A reminder of the three questions opened up for us today by our readings. What are you prepared to give up? Who are you prepared to welcome? What is it that you value most. Thank you. 
Let's pray together. God of love, we give you thanks for the life and witness of this church and for those who have gone before us these 150 years to establish a community of love in this place. We remember our place in the life of this circuit and in the worldwide church in all its denominations. Guide and strengthen us as we continue to respond to your command to go and bear witness to the eternal life of love in which you invite all creation to play its part. God of love, we give thanks for the spirit of justice that you have placed within our hearts and which prompts us to recognize and name the injustices that surround us. We remember before you those in our community and around the world who live with the reality of violence, exploitation, exclusion. Give us courage to stand alongside those who need our help. Give us grace to acknowledge our own part in the injustices of the world and to seek your peace. God of love, we give thanks for the people in whom we find your love for those who care for us and those who allow us to care for them. We remember before you people whose lives touch ours and especially any who are in need of company, comfort and support just now. Give us the insight to see our lives together as you see them and the patience to embrace the needs of others as equal to our own. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen.